Hello. Welcome. Come on in. Thank you for coming. I'm happy to see you. How are you? Mm. Yeah? Fine? Good? Let's try. I'm doing great. I'm excited today. I feel really good. I'm happy to be here. It's nice to see you. What day is it today? Hmm. Now ask me. Today is Saturday. It's Saturday. What day is it today? Exactly. Wait, what did you say? Very good. Welcome, teachers from all around the world. My name is Jason Levine, also known as Fluency MC. Today is Saturday. It's Saturday, and I'm here to do a webinar with you on, do you know what topic it is? Teaching English to Children or Young Learners. What's the date today? Now ask me. Hmm. It's January 21st, 2023. I did the Now You Ask Me if it's maybe difficult for them to say the date themselves. If not, what's the date today? If they've been practicing it with you, right? They should be able to do it. But if not, what's the, they ask me, what's the date today? I say, oh, it's January 21st, 2023, right? Then we can go back. What's the date today? If they remember it, fine. If not, show them we're going to talk about how important it is to see language, even though you might have the instinct to try to get them to do it without looking at it. If we take language away from their eyes, if it's not a natural thing for them to take it away, we probably shouldn't do it. No, no, no. We really shouldn't do it. <laughs> We're going to talk about that as it relates to games, uh, songs, and other activities. Welcome, everyone, to Teaching English to Children. Once again, my name is Jason R. Levine, better known as Fluency MC. This webinar is brought to you by the American TESOL Institute. Shout out to them and shout out to Prep It for the Zoom room that we are using today. If you know me, you know that what I principally do is help kids and adults practice English through music that I create. And I go to schools and do shows uh, to try to motivate kids to watch videos at home, listen to songs outside of class. My songs, great, or any songs that they like is good. Um, but I make songs with special focus on English language learning, uh, like the irregular verb song Stick, Stuck, Stuck, which is, uh, you see part of it here, now you know, new, known, over there. We have an advantage with kids in the sense that, you know, if everybody needs a strong foundation of vocabulary and grammar, and uh, that includes all four skills, so that includes, you know, pronunciation, obviously um, speaking and pronunciation, listening, uh, reading, and writing. Um, we all need that, but we have an advantage with young learners because uh, when, depending on how young they are and what experience they've had uh, learning English, they're usually more open, less analytical because they don't have the capacity to try to say what's this grammar and how does it work so that if we do things in a fun way that engages them, they're just going to soak up the language and they're going to love it. And then when they get older, so I guess, I'm sorry, I should explain, I'm thinking kind of the young, young ones, when they get to be in middle school, uh, they're still young learners, but maybe because we're calling this children, I'm thinking of the youngest mainly, and I don't talk about the youngest enough, so probably be focusing more on, more on that today, but really, um, the biggest problem I see, and maybe some of you see this as well, is... Uh, Programs, whether it's in public schools, 
private schools uh, in the United States, uh, the UK, uh, or any country in the world that's doing English. A uh, similar problem that when programs are challenging students to try to use English in more academic ways, in more uh, analytical ways, right? They want to uh, get them using using English to do projects, and and it's wonderful. It's really wonderful, uh, but without a strong foundation of vocabulary and grammar, this is not going to work. So I'm thinking of the middle school student, the high school student, who uh, never really got that foundation early on. So maybe this is an obvious thing, uh, but I feel like it doesn't happen enough. Uh, certainly with older learners, uh, and this is where I put most of my, uh, uh, do most of my work and, and focus most of my attention is on that middle school, on uh, high school student uh, who uh, never got this. Uh, so if you are with, um, if you're a new teacher, traveling abroad, the American TESOL Institute, for example, uh, and you're with kids, you might think, of course, you know, we play games. Of course, we sing songs. But really important to understand that you have this great opportunity uh, there that if you do fun things and you are aware of what they need to learn, uh, then, wow, you're going to really be helping these kids out when they get older. Really important to consider the difference between studying a language, practicing a language, and using a language. So um, with young learners, studying is something generally, I think, to avoid. Uh, even with older learners, we often, I think, should be avoiding it. So for example, uh, studying grammar rules, uh, translating vocabulary, like this type of thing uh, doesn't need to happen. Right, because when you do activities just with English only, where you are uh, using lots of visuals, you are using a lot of repetition, which we're going to get to. Um, studying the language, like learning about the language, um, is I think not such a great idea. This is you know my point of view, and over the course of my career, I've seen that you know teachers with experience uh, teaching young learners either never. Uh, focused on, you know, studying the language with them, uh, or they learned the hard way, or not necessarily the hard way, but you know what I mean, and realize that, oh, you know, if we talk about, like, you know, parts of speech and, you know, uh, look under the microscope at the language, this is not going to be motivating for them. Um, and most more importantly, uh, they won't learn as quickly, uh, not just because they're not motivated, that's a big part of it, but because that's not how we naturally acquire language. We need lots of exposure to comprehensible input. And of course, later studying will be more important. And if they have uh, the skills to do it, uh, we're going to get to that in a moment, then, then they're going to want to because they have that foundation of language to be able to really think more about the language and study. Uh, so practicing uh, and using are not the same thing. So very important uh, to my mind to distinguish between practicing English and using English. So if you think uh, as a teacher, practicing English uh, could mean what you do in the classroom. Uh, possibly yes, possibly no. So if it's a communicative activity, let's say you have, you know, a little bit older students and you've got them, you know, in some kind of conversation, uh, I think that's more using English. You're in a safe space using it. It's not the real world, but you are doing some communicative activity uh, that doesn't uh, rely on repetition. So if you think about practicing an instrument, you think about practicing a sport, you think about dance, those are skills and we build skills uh, through practice, through repetition. Um, this is why the audiolingual method uh, became popular. People realized that. Uh, but if it's repeating things that are not contextualized, that are not interesting, that are not connected to the student's life, then like a lot of audiolingual, then, hey, is it really worth it? Uh, no. So we've got two approaches that I think don't work well. One that's focusing mainly on looking at the language and how it works and the grammar. And another is uh, not doing that, but doing a lot of rote learning, a lot of repetition in a way that's not uh, interesting to uh, uh, people, to kids in this case, right? Uh, so if you're in the classroom doing some 
repetitive activity, great. But strongly suggest that we do a lot of that practice outside of class, especially if you are in a situation where you don't have the kids very often. What can they do with the language that they practiced, I think, is the most important thing. And that's using it. So if you check the definition of practice, you see it's repeating things. Luckily, kids love to repeat. Now, why I ask middle school and high school kids often, uh, you know, I give them an example of like, you know, do you have a little brother or sister or little cousin uh, and you're in the car and they hear a song and they want to hear it, they play it once. And then after the song finishes, what do they want? They say, oh, they want to hear it again. And then again, and then again, or you read a story to a kid uh, three years old, and they say, again, again, we read this story seven times, right? Now, why does this happen? And uh, it's it's funny, you know, uh, it takes it takes the kids, middle school, uh, high school, it takes them a moment to really think about it. Uh, and, and not always, uh, but sometimes the student will say what it really is, at least what I think it is, which is, it's just, it's an instinct. Right. It's like, you know, I have to learn a language to by repeating, like, you know, I need to learn my first language, play the song again and again. Right. Because it's required. Right. Uh, this is what happens with kids. And when kids get older and they're able to think more analytically, they stop doing that. Right. And those are those middle school and high school kids. And then uh, so whether they figure it out or not, we figure it out together. And they're like, oh, yeah. So it's not that we, it's not that I'm so bad at English, maybe, right? It's not that, you know, I missed my chance as a kid. I just need to get repetition. I'm not practicing. It's like saying I'm not good at the piano when I'm always trying to perform for people, but I never practiced or dance or right basketball or whatever analogy you like. And here we are, that idea of the foundation. Right. And you can see the word repeat here in Boom's Taxonomy. Right. And that's what's so important. And, uh, you know, if I'm talking about teaching English to adults, then it's like, OK, how can we get adults to repeat things when they tend to rely on their uh, analytical brain and start thinking so much about how the language works and they think repetition is boring? OK, we need to figure out what songs, games and other activities adults like that they don't feel are childish with children, right? We don't have to do that. They love to repeat, <laughs> they'll just repeat. Um, now, not anything, and as they get older, it can become an issue as we're talking about. But what I wanna show you today are activities that I think, um, that I've seen my young learners uh, repeat and enjoy. When we're getting that repetitive uh, practice, we are down here and as a result, if we're motivated to get that repetitive practice, if it's fun, a game, a song, then we will remember because we need those multiple exposures. And then that builds the foundation that enables us later, um, especially thinking about middle school and high school, uh, able to use English. And then the studying comes back in, right? You know, if you've got that base, then yeah, you will do some research and you will study for uh, a test like the TOEIC or the TOEFL and you'll do well, right? Because you have that base at the bottom. You're not trying to do everything at once, which won't work. Practice builds accuracy. Accuracy builds confidence. Confidence builds fluency. That's kind of become my credo. Uh, this is, in a nutshell, right, what, what we've been talking about. So. Songs and games, but what do we focus on in those songs and games? That's the key, because you can have a, a song the kids like or a game the kids like to play, but the language in is it isn't necessarily what they need at that point. Um, it could be <clears throat> either language that isn't that common, or it's practiced with things they don't really need to practice with as much as other things, or uh, it's too hard, it's too easy, it's not interesting for them. So doing a needs analysis of your students obviously is super important at any any time you do, uh, you teach. What I feel is very, very important early on is uh, the rhythm of the language, the stress, which uh, we practiced earlier. Uh, when you arrived here, uh, and we're going to get back to it and talk about it. But I think you remember I highlighted the syllables, the word stress um, in the sentence, but not talking about the stress, just making sure they see it 
and hear it, but we'll get into that more. Another thing is the sounds of the language vis-a-vis um, -vis how they are written. So the sound spelling relationship. Uh, we don't want students to struggle later with this. So a lot of teaching children to me is thinking about what, how to avoid uh, situations that middle school and high school students and beyond are in. And one of those situations is, right, they'll say, oh, uh, I totally understand this when I read it, but if the script, but when I listen to it, phew, no way. So a lot of that has to do with the rhythm. Uh, and another part of it has to do with the sound spelling relationships. So for example, I'll say to students, uh, what's, what's this letter of the alphabet? And they'll say A. And I'll say, that's right. And what sound does A make? How do you say this word, this fruit? And uh, most of them won't say apple, right? It's possible. They'll say apple. I'm like, but that's A. Ah. Oh, so A makes the A. So we can talk about that just a little bit, right? Just a little bit. And then, okay, well, I have a song to practice the this sound, right? A, A, apple get them to repeat. So then I usually ask them, right? Well, if it's a, a, apple in the song, then b, b, k, k, right? And after that, I wouldn't talk about, you know, like, i, i is i is i, right? So it's not about thinking like, oh, the, the letter is i, but the short sound is i. And in my language, it's e, but then we have e, which is Eh, right? It's very complicated getting into uh, phonetics. Uh, so it's it's not about, again, studying this, right? Eh, eh, apple, b, b, ball, k, k, cat, don't fall off the wall. Eh, eh, apple, b, b, ball, k, k, cat, don't fall off the wall. Meow! D, d, dog, eh, eh, egg, f, f, frog, long legs. Good, good girl. Insect, sat and sat. J -j jam, k -k kite, l -l lamp. Who turned off the light? M -m moon, n -n nose, a -a orange, grows and grows. All right, so that's a bit of the song. And then the second part of the song is a, a, b, b, right? So the gap fill act ideas like we saw at the beginning with, you know, what, what day is it today where you're removing words, uh, you can decide how much they see the words and how much they don't. But as I said, the best thing is that they decide, right? So if you notice, so if we get to this part, right? And they they can't remember the words. That's They may want to go back and try it again, right? Okay, everybody, stand up. Sit down. Stand up. No, we could repeat it, right? Oh, jump up and down. You got to stand up again. <laughs> should I, should I, have, I usually have a slide there where it's stand up again, right? Okay. So then they're up. Clap your hands. Look up. Look down. Look left. Look right. Stand up. Turn around. We have walk, stop, right? And you can add your own. Oh, and then look again, right? What's this, right? You can play Simon Says. Great repetitive game uh, with action verbs, phrasal verbs like that. And again, we're not talking about these are phrasal verbs, but if you think, well, because the kids are young, um, these verbs are too hard or something, no, right? They're hard only, as I say in the song that's coming up, only hard if you study them. I have a song called Watch Me, which is a way to uh, use these action verbs. Right? So let's go back to the, you know, watch me stand up, watch me sit down, watch me jump and turn around, right? Watch me laugh. Watch me snap. So having them uh, see not just the text, the lyrics, right? Uh, but also see where the rhythm is marked. That's what's missing uh, from lyrics because, 
right? They're not written. And also uh, songs that are not written for language learning uh, are going to play with the stress in ways that uh, is different from oral discourse, the way we speak. So um, really important to get them to see and hear language in songs and everywhere else. That is what they're going to hear uh, when they're out in the world. So where to put the syllable stress if you're not sure, right? You can check a dictionary. You can ask somebody to help you. So I have a video for this. You can check it out. All these videos you can find just with Fluent CMC and the names like Watch Me. The alphabet one is A to Z. So if you look at A to Z sounds, I also have an A to Z letters, which focuses on the letters and then one about the sounds. Let's play a game. So many different games you can play with kids, different platforms. Um, obviously, you don't need to do it with it. All right. Well, there are so many different games we can play with kids. I mean, if, if I had a teaching games to children webinar, right, I would need a whole series of, of these to talk about different games. So I'm going to focus on my favorite platform, which is bamboozle.com. And I like creating the traditional bamboozle games. Uh, but they now have so many different kinds of games you can play. So let me just show you. So we're going to look at my game, Watch Me. So I'm, we're not watching the video for Watch Me, but looking at the game instead. And when we, so you could imagine, right, just having kids do it, like watch me get up, sit down, like we were doing. And then you could, uh, in a different order, or show this video, the song first, have them do something with the song, uh, play the game first, right? But really good to have them repeat it in different ways. Uh, some people like games more than songs, vice versa, but also, uh, you know, to make the activities uh, more varied. And here you can focus more on their pronunciation and uh, other things. If uh, this is a very basic game, but you can make more and play more complicated games and get more uh, insight into uh, each person's uh, pronunciation and grammar uh, because you can put them on teams. And uh, yeah, I'll explain more. So uh, if we're going to play Watch Me, we can do play here. And then okay, um, these are Bamboozle Plus. Right. So I have plus so I can play these games. Uh, but Bamboozle, if you play for free, you can play uh, the games I'm going to show you. OK, but they also have. Wow. Look at all this great stuff. Uh, if you know Bamboozle, you know, this is pretty recent uh, in the last year or two. Uh, they've developed uh, other other games you can play with the same material. Right. So I'm going to focus on this one because it's free for you if you're going to play and you can also play my games for free i'm going to show you uh give you the link so any of my games you can play so for example you could watch the video for watch me uh with the music and you can play the game all free so let's imagine we are going to have three teams and uh 15 questions and are we going to play with power-ups i love playing with power-ups i'll show you what i mean we're going to play the classic game, okay? So uh, I'm going to be all three teams just to show you, right? So I choose we can do vocabulary first, which is great, right? So maybe, I don't know, cool, cool, sunglasses, I don't know, leaves, right? And if they don't know these words, great time to introduce them. Uh, and it changes every time you reset the game, right? So candy or lollipop uh, in the U.S., more specifically lollipop, uh, planet or Saturn, right, et cetera. And then you start, you can name the teams, right, over here. But we're not going to do that just for uh, to show you. But so if they choose underpants, oh, I have a timer on. You can take the timer off. So if you have a team of like two or three kids, right? You get them to try to negotiate what's the answer and, and the pronunciation. Oh, it's, it's a la laugh, laugh. We can kind of help them with it. Laugh, okay. Ah, oh, so, okay, give us your final answer. And someone on the team can say, watch me laugh. Correct. All right. Okay, team two is going to choose the hot dog. Oh, reset score. But team two already had zero. If I had, if team two had more points, it would go back to zero. Uh, let's do one more for team three. The strawberry, please. Hey, there's big pun. What's he doing? 
Okay, we'll stop here. I just wanted to show you what you could do with vocabulary from Watch Me. You have a group that's a bit older, a bit bit higher level, and Watch Me is a little easy for them, or you've done Watch Me, and now you're going to move into something uh, similar, but uh, with phrasal verbs, you could use turn it on. So everybody, listen, watch, and repeat. Watch me. Turn it on. Turn it off. And show me too. Turn it on. Turn it off. Turn it up. Turn it down. Turn it up. Turn it down. Oh. Put it down. Pick it up. Put it down. Pick it up. Put it in. Take it out. Put it in. Take it out. Oh, take it off. Put it on. Take it off. Put it on. Turn it on. Turn it off. Turn it up. Turn it down. Put it down. Pick it up. Put it in. Take it out. Turn it, take it off. Put it on, right? Uh, with really young kids, they might want to keep going. But if they're getting a little older, right, you could do that once and you could say, so is it easy or difficult to remember? Hmm, what's this? Put it down and, right, they might say, take it up, pick it up, right? So let's practice with a song, right? So here we have uh, longer sentences. So it's not just about the uh, word stress on the syllables, but also the stress in the sentence. And again, I don't suggest talking about that so much. You might want to say, hey, well, not might want. You would want to highlight uh, the first time you show them something with the stress where it is. Okay, so that part is the rhythm. Use the word rhythm with kids. You don't have to get into word stress, sex and stress. Take it out, put it in. They could repeat it. And songs, the, the whole thing with songs, with, with lyrics, is that you don't always have to sing them, right? If you don't have the lyrics and you're just listening to it, you hey, I just have to sing this song. But you can do all kinds of things with lyrics uh, that are not singing, right? It could just be them reading it themselves. It could be uh, reading it out loud, uh, just like conversation style. These verbs are only hard when you study them. Or right? Funny voices or like poetry. So there's also a little message in here. I uh, alluded to it earlier. These verbs are only hard when you study them. Uh, I don't usually talk about the lyrics, just I get, make sure they understand them. And then they start repeating them. And hopefully the message is getting across. Listen, watch, repeat, and you can use them when you need them, which is every time you pick up a pen or start speaking. So when I practice this with students for the first time, I break it up, right? Okay, everybody, listen, watch, repeat. And you can use them when you need them, right? Put it down, pick it up. Take it off, put it on. Turn it on, turn it off. Turn it up, turn it down. Let's check out the video. I'll just show you part of it so you get the idea. Out. Who in? Out. Who in? Take it out, put it in. Take it out, put it in again. These verbs are only hard when you study them. Listen, watch, repeat, and you can use them when you need them, which is every time you pick up a pen or start speaking. Down, up, down, up. Put it down, pick it up, put it down, pick it up again. Do it and the verbs will soon stick, stuck, stuck, my friend. Listen, watch, repeat, and you can use them when you need them, which is every time. You pick up a pen or start speaking. Notice I made a game also for this. So uh, I'll show you how you can get to my games and videos, but you can also uh, make your own games based on what you're doing uh, with Bamboozle um, or based on uh, my songs or other people's songs or any material you have. So easy to then make a game uh, where you get kids in teams and they're practicing the language from it. Asking questions in English is, you know, one of the things that in middle school and high school, 
uh, can be very painful if they didn't get the basic grammar they need. Questions in English um, are difficult compared to many other languages um, because of the word order and uh, the do operator, uh, modal verbs, things that don't exist uh, in, in every language. And uh, an interesting thing that um, I didn't really notice until a few years ago, uh, which is worth uh, talking about here, is that uh, in French, even though there is a similarity, I live in France, I teach, uh, I live in Paris and teach in France in schools. So even though uh, French, like English, has subject verb inversion for questions, right? And we learned, I learned that we have to ask a question that way, right? So I, I, I wouldn't want to say, for example, uh, vous voulez quelque chose, right? I'd want to say, voulez-vous quelque, voulez, voulez -vous quelque chose, right? Or est-ce que vous voulez, right? Like these structures for questions. And that makes sense to me, learning this, because uh, we have the same thing in English, right? But then when I moved here, I realized that you can keep a subject verb word order in a question and be polite. So you could say, uh, excusez-moi, vous voulez quelque chose? You know, vous allez bien aujourd'hui, right? But in English, you know, you want something, you know, you're doing well. So what I've noticed with older kids, uh, middle school, high school, university, and of course adults, is that they did not get enough practice uh, asking questions with subject verb inversion, with the do operator, uh, with modal verbs. And so what ends up happening is they're in a situation where they need to be polite or they don't know somebody, right? And, you know, they say something like, you know, uh, uh, you, uh, uh, you are going there tomorrow, right? <laughs> Instead of, are you going there, right? Or um, uh, you, like you like computer games? So with your friend, it's okay. You like computer games, right? But it sounds a little strange. And of course, if they don't have for, for when you get older, and then if you don't have that grammar later, you're going to have a big problem. So this is back to the very beginning today when I spoke about uh, how building that foundation is important. So uh, you could make a song and I have a song with do questions. I want to talk about do, uh, but I thought, or a game, but I thought I'd also... Um, because we talked about games, we've talked about games and songs, uh, look at ways that you could, um, and it's kind of gamifying grammar, but it looks like, so we're studying here. Uh, but basically what we're doing is right providing the language for students to practice. And this is a very simple thing. You could make this uh, much better than I did. And I um, actually used this for a card game I made where I you can also cut them up and you can have them try to put sentences together. So here they don't have to cut anything up. They're seeing the, these different possibilities, right? And they're also seeing something else, do and does. Right? Do you need to talk about that? Right? If we're really young, no, I wouldn't do that. I'd say, we're just going to ask questions. Like, we had, let's ask questions, right? Oh, do you? Do you live in... Okay, and so anyway, you can imagine things you could do here having them just repeat after you at the beginning. And then what's the answer? Oh, do you live in Paris? So students here, oh, yes, I do. Okay, uh, do you live in, and you can elicit it from them, um, China? No, I don't. Oh, does your mother, all right, so then we get into the does and doesn't. So a unit in a book where you're studying this, I personally think is not the best idea. You you want to give them right the, the full grammatical forms, um, but it could just be something like this. And then notice I keep, I still have the yes, I do, no, I don't here. And now we've taken away the the subject, the person here. Right? Do you do your parents? So if they make a mistake, if they say, you know, do your sister, oh, really, do your sister, you know, you could go back here. Again, I wouldn't take this away from them until you feel like they've gotten it enough. Right? And then, of course, you may go play a game also, um, a song, another activity, but you could keep this as kind of a base for especially developing writing skills. Oh, well, look what we took away now. So now it's do or does with the answers. 
And you could certainly uh, cut these up, have them put the sentences together, have them come up with, uh, oh, do your parents, do your friends, what else? You could say, oh, you know, does your guinea pig <laughs> speak English, right? So you could get them to fill, fill out a table too. And here where we removed right, the compliments and they could either try to remember some of them or come up with their own. So I think if you're, when you introduce language, so you could do the same thing with, you know, modal verbs, can, for example, without talking about the grammar so much, we can show it, model it. And uh, of course, this would not be the only activity you'd want to do. I wanted to show you something that's not just, you know, a game or a song. It's a little more traditional looking at the language this way. Um, but of course, kind of gamifying it by taking things out and, you know, cutting them up and, and so forth. Well, folks, this brings us to the end of our session today. Thanks so much for joining live. Uh, thanks for watching the recording. If you're watching this, uh, please share it with friends and colleagues that you think would find it useful. Uh, just a little bit we can do in a short time to talk about teaching English to children or any of these topics, but I hope you found it useful. Have a good day. Goodbye. See you soon. And of course, see you later, alligator. English teachers worldwide, take care. Peace, respect.